This workshop tonight memorializes the events of Kristall Nacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, a notorious pogrom launched by the Nazi regime against German Jews on the night of November 9th to the 10th. This event marked an important turning point on the twisted road to the Holocaust. And every year, AHEC takes this date as an opportunity for education by bringing in a leading scholar to work with teachers and also to provide a community talk. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce Dr. Wolf Gruner. Dr. Gruner is a prolific scholar and a specialist in the history of the Holocaust and genocide studies, who's earned his PhD in history from Technical University of Berlin in 1994. He holds the Chappelle Duran Chair in Jewish Studies, is Professor of History at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, and is the founding director of the USC Dornsai Center for Advanced Genocide Research. He's been a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, among many others. And since 2017, he's been an appointed member of the Academic Committee of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and also holds a seat on the Academic Advisory Board at Yad Vashem. Dr. Gruner is the author of 10 books on the Holocaust and is published in German, Spanish, and English. His new book, Impudent Jews, Forgotten Stories of Individual Jewish Resistance in Hitler's Germany, is forthcoming with Yale University Press. This book will feature the stories of five Jewish men and women who resisted Nazi persecution in different ways. The book demonstrates the wide range of individual resistance and restores agency to the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. And part of his research will be presented here in this workshop tonight. So this is fresh new material that we'll be working with. So please join me now in warmly welcoming Dr. Wolf Greer. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, since I give this talk tomorrow, where I read a paper, I uh, kind of thought today I do this just uh, kind of in a conversation with you. So uh, feel free to chime in, uh, interrupt, uh, ask questions if uh, you would like so. Uh, and what I thought is um, to do here is uh, to think a little bit through uh, the problem of um, Jewish resistance. Um, and not just my recent research, which I will present tomorrow uh, uh, too, but also uh, some new trends which I kind of recognize as a Holocaust scholar, where research is going uh, regarding Jewish resistance. So um, first I wanted to say uh, there is this, there's practically three big misconceptions about the Holocaust. Uh, one is that um, the killings were kind of industrial. Um, the other one is um, that um, uh, I'm kind of blanking. I'm kind of woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning, so I, <laughs> I'm missing one now. But the third one is important for us. Uh, that's the uh, that there was not real a uh, lot of resistance uh, throughout the Holocaust, and uh, even more. Sometimes you can hear. Uh, notions of Jewish passivity, yeah, that, uh, and with kind of this uh, context that actually when you talk about passivity, it means also somehow the Jews would enable the persecution because they didn't resist, which is kind of, uh, I think, very, uh, uh, how can I say this, it's hypocritical to say this because nobody really can understand these conditions. And I'm saying this uh, especially because um, how did I come to this topic? So I grew up in East Germany, in communist Germany, behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, I lived there till the wall came down uh, when I was 28. So I have part of my adult life uh, uh, spent in this dictatorship. Um, and in the beginning, I was think of my, I started to study uh, history with the idea to study the Holocaust, uh, to understand racism in Germany. Um, uh, but I didn't really work on resistance. So I worked on Jewish forced labor, that's my dissertation. Then I looked into the role of municipalities, which was not known that municipalities, actually city governments, were really initiative. A lot of the uh, persecution of the Jews happened on the ground in lo local places and were not ordered from Berlin or from the Nazi government. And quite the opposite, some of the ideas from local governments were actually picked up by the Nazi government and then transformed into, translated into laws and decrees. So there's a lot uh, going on what I was researching. Um, when I looked into these municipalities, I realized for the Jewish population in each town, they had very different experiences. And even more so, 
is dependent on what social status you wear. Uh, did you wear a shop owner? Were you a teacher? What a profession uh, the family uh, kind of um, was into? This kind of determined also how much you were exposed to the persecution. And it was very diverse because, for example, in Hamburg, um, there was a lot of persecution of poor Jews because they depended on public welfare. So the municipality had to spend money on them. On the opposite side, the uh, economy department was quite lenient towards Jewish shop owners. So you see that in the same town, the municipality could really react, uh, kind of uh, formulate very different persecution policies. So this kind of created the situation that uh, Jews were exposed to very diverse policies. And this was, I think, also there is an explanation. Sometimes the question arises, why didn't Jews leave earlier? And I think this is one reason, because they were so differently exposed, they couldn't really make sense uh, of what happened. Sometimes they were not even uh, really targeted. Yeah? And so, um, but when I looked into these different policies, then I realized uh, that uh, how you are affected as a family, as a person, also in a way determines how you respond to policies. And uh, so I was uh, starting to look into uh, responses of Jews more and more in my work, uh, and then uh, coincidence hit. So uh, I was getting the call to uh, uh, kind of move from Germany to USC, to Los, on uh, Los Angeles, and I um, uh, knew that when I moved to LA, I won't uh, have access to archives in the way, same way as I had in, back in Germany. So I used the last two months of my time in Berlin to do something what I had kind of planned earlier to do, because at some point I was um, coming across a source which nobody has used ever for the persecution of the Jews. These were police logbooks of police precincts in Berlin, which had survived. And out of 300 precincts, we have, I think, 40 logbooks covering the time from 33 till 45. And this is a hard source to read, even for a specialist uh, like me, because it's all handwritten. It's uh, tons of different handwritings, because every ordinary policeman writes what they uh, kind of do during the day. So I thought I'll go through them and look what, uh, what I find. But I thought I expected to find traces of persecution. So I don't know, um, the enforcement of certain local decrees or national laws. And then I found this arrest of a Jew for uh, uh, public protest. And I said, what? I, at this point, I had studied the, uh, especially the persecution of the German Jews for 20 years. And I said, I never came across that somebody in public protested against uh, the persecution. Uh, and then I thought, this triggered my interest. And it resonated with me in a way very differently because since I grew up in East Germany, I suddenly realized when we thought about resistance, we had a very kind of restricted perspective. We always thought about armed resistance, right? Uprisings, partisans. But then I realized my own experience in East Germany, I was a cultural kind of dissident in a way. So I was part of the cultural underground. And we were constantly surveilled. There were raids of kind of private kind of exhibitions and so on. And suddenly I realized what, that there are similarities, how a regime reacts to very small acts of kind of uh, uh, distance or uh, kind of uh, opposition. And so I started to uh, look more into this. And this was practically the beginning of my research project, which then took now 14 years. So the book will be published next year. So that means 15 years of my life is uh, kind of going or uh, went into the um, uh, research of individual acts of Jewish resistance. And I will explain in a, uh, a, mid, a minute what this means. But what I wanted to do for this is uh, to look at three things. One is, as I said, my research on individual resistance. Oh, there it was. So uh, then I would also, what I recently realized uh, that also Zionist youth movements had an uh, interesting kind of impact on how especially younger Jews responded. Uh, and then um, I think a th new threat is 
woman uh, and the kind of uh, misconception about the role of woman in resistance. Uh, and I think we have to uh, reassess what the women actually, uh, uh, how instrumental they were for resistance. So that's what I wanted to do, if you, yeah, if you agree. Um, so when I, uh, when I think about, uh, when I thought about resistance, um, it was interesting that right after the war, you can find books about, the first books on the Holocaust, they all have a big chapter on resistance. But already there, is this kind of uh, vision or the, 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 the assessment. Resistance was mainly happening in Eastern Europe, not in Germany. It was mainly organized and armed. So these kind of three things are kind of uh, the base for these first assessments of resistance. And you have to, what you probably all uh, know, like the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is always a subject, the partisans, sometimes the uh, kind of the uh, parach parachuters, the parach who kind of descended with the parachutes. Uh, so, but the, most or less, these were the stories. Um, and in general Holocaust history, um, later on, this was reinforced because one of the kind of most important Holocaust historians, uh, Raoul Hilberg, uh, said in the 1960s in his kind of standard uh, work on the uh, Holocaust that there was an absence of Jewish resistance. And at the time, in the 1960s, in Israel, there was an uproar. No, uh, they could not believe that he actually said this because they worked since kind of the inception when they studied the Holocaust, they worked on resistance. Um, and they thought also in a little bit broader sense about resistance, not just about the partisans and the uprisings, but in Israel they also thought about cultural resistance, means education, religious, spiritual resistance, these are kind of in a broader sense. But it focused also mainly on Eastern Europe, on the ghettos, uh, and small towns in uh, occupied Poland or the occupied uh, Baltic states uh, and the Soviet Union. So. Um, Individual resistance, as I understand it, didn't really play a role. Uh, however, there were some people thinking about this. There was an, uh, a kind of an Austrian uh, Holocaust scholar, a German uh, um, a Jewish survivor, and also an Israeli who all thought in the 1970s that we need to broaden up our understanding what resistance is. And uh, they thought about that acts, uh, any act kind of against the perpetrator is uh, or has to be classified as resistance. So um, with my understanding of from my personal experience, how a dictatorship kind of punishes small acts, which sometimes the people themselves don't even realize uh, that they are perceived as dangerous. So I thought translated to this much more kind of uh, um, much harsher regime of the Nazis, that actually a lot of the, uh, the things Jews how they reacted towards Nazi laws, decrees, and all these kind of uh, persecuting <coughs> circumstances were perceived as dangerous and as resistance. And this is then uh, uh, how I found my material, because I was um, for, uh, uh, mostly looking at police records. So I tried to find more of these logbooks. Uh, I, uh, I was not lucky, but there were other police work records in other towns. And then I went to court records and I found tons of trials against Jews who publicly protested against um, the Nazis in Germany and Austria. So um, when I did my research, I thought we need to redefine what resistance is or Jewish resistance is. And this is what I did. I took a very well-known definition from Yehuda Bauer, the Israeli Holocaust scholar, uh, very, uh, who had kind of created this uh, definition in the 1970s. And I just did one small thing. I added just one word. And this is this. So it's the same definition. I just added this individual. And suddenly, it kind of changes the perspective in a, a dramatic way. Yeah. Um, because now you can focus on individuals, also the type of what is perceived as resistance changes. And let me share some kind of thoughts with you. And really feel free to uh, kind of intervene, yeah? So, um, 
to use some imagery, when we look at photographs uh, of the persecution in the Third Reich, we, uh, this is one of the well-known photographs. Yeah? This is uh, uh, from March 1933. Uh, this is Munich. Um, he is a very well-known Jewish lawyer, uh, Michael Siegel. He um, is dragged through the uh, streets of Munich by the stormtroopers here. And we find this image usually used in uh, uh, history books to kind of illustrate the terror of the first weeks and months in Nazi Germany. But why was he actually dragged? It was not a random act. He was dragged because this poster, the sign said, I, won't, uh, I will never complain at the police station anymore. What did he do? He actually uh, uh, had a client who was arrested by the, uh, by the stormtroopers and he tried to get uh, this client out because he was not charged with anything. And so he tried to intervene and get his client out. This ended up in this uh, kind of act of violence towards him. Yeah? Then uh, I looked through more photographs uh, and to find evidence of kind of oppositional reactions. <laughs> and then I looked back at this photograph. I used this in my class, this photograph, to illustrate local, as I talked about, the uh, local city government initiatives, because she, uh, this is a small town and uh, uh, the municipality forbade Jews to use the uh, public swimming pool. And uh, there are these signs up here uh, for Jews, no access for Jews, and dogs not allowed. So I used this always for this purpose. And then I realized, look at the picture. This woman standing at kind of next to these signs, what is her body language, right? Yeah, I mean, she is a little bit tense when you look at her, her face, but her, her posture is, you can't do this with me, right? So, I mean, this is, uh, it's not somebody who kind of, uh, kind of uh, looks like uh, suffering, it's more an oppositional kind of uh, uh, way of uh, attitude, yeah? Yeah. Where was that picture found? Uh, I think this is from the Holocaust Museum. That's a good question. I need to look this. Oh, this is actually not the Holocaust Museum. I, this is actually from. This is from a, a German, um, from a German uh, um, uh, image repository. But uh, usually these pictures were taken by Jews, and then they were smuggled out of Germany, and they ended up either with uh, big newspapers or sometimes in private possessions, and then they were donated. As this next picture, actually, which is my favorite one, is uh, this is uh, Lissy Rosenfeld. Yeah, so she was a Jewish woman, a young Jewish woman in Vienna, and this picture is taken in uh, the summer of 1939. Um, I don't know. Does anybody read German here? Yeah, only for Aryans. So she is a Jewish woman. And look at her, how she sits there. Yeah? So she commits three crimes in the eyes of the Nazis. First, she doesn't obey to this decree that she uh, is not supposed to sit there. The second one is she even documents this crime. And the third one is then, later, she smuggles this negative out of the, uh, when she crosses the border. And that's how it ended up in the Holocaust Museum in uh, uh, DC. So when you see these are small acts, right? But what I found in these police logbooks is that a lot of people for these very small acts actually ended up in jail because they were perceived as dangerous, as kind of offenses against the political kind of uh, framework of the Nazi uh, state. And uh, so I found countless of trials uh, for acts of opposition uh, committed by Jewish men and women uh, in Nazi Germany. And interestingly, it's not only about like in the beginning, it is uh, over the whole time span of the uh, kind of uh, time into the Second World War. So for example, uh, even in 1941 and 1942, I found acts of public protest where Jews spoke up against the persecution. Yeah. Do you see any age um, restrictions? Is it more younger people than older people? 
No. That that's was my, uh, one of my really revelations. Because sometimes when we have uh, research on res resistors or rescuers or perpetrators, we, uh, uh, there's tons of research trying to find character lines. What enables somebody to be a resistor? What enables somebody to be a perpetrator? Uh, there are kind of psychological investigations. And some people have the idea it is the family, how they raised. Others think these might uh, have to be outsiders. Uh, so there are different concepts about them. Interestingly, in my research, there's no differences in uh, kind of or no trends in age. There's no trends in socialization and education. There are no trends in generations. There's no trend in kind of social status. Um, I have to kind of say, in the variety of uh, the resistance acts, there are some where elderly are a little bit more kind of uh, active than younger people. And then vice versa, we have some also where younger people are more active than others. Yeah? But uh, in general, I was really stunned by this because uh, often we think younger people are more prone to, uh, to uh, do resistance, but actually the reality shows no. Yeah? So to share a few examples with you, um, some will also I talk about tomorrow in the lecture. But uh, so to give you an idea of what types of resistance acts were actually committed yeah, and were punished. So this is, uh, he was a, a shopkeeper in Hamburg. Uh, he um, went, he was married and he went with his wife uh, to a bus terminal in 1936. So after the Nuremberg laws. And uh, at the bus terminal, he was waiting for the departure of the bus, and his wife was already in the bus. And then he uh, stood in front of a Nazi swastika logo on the public bus, like here. And this is, by the way, one of the first uh, um, examples of historical reenactment, because that's a Gestapo picture, and that's a Gestapo man. And this is the conductor of the bus. That's uh, the place where the, uh, the wife actually sat. So Bornstein was here, and with his cane, he tried to destroy, uh, scratch the swastika. <laughs> yeah? So, um, and to give you, I mean, it's a little bit hard to say. This is a blow up of the Gestapo photo. So I don't know if you see this here. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> so, and he's not the only one. So uh, you find uh, kind of um, Jews um, uh, ripped down Nazi flags. They uh, besmeared the kind of displays of the anti-Semitic uh, newspaper, the, the Stürmer. So you have, they ripped down uh, anti-Jewish posters. So, and many of them were caught and then went on trial and that's how I know about it, yeah? So uh, you have acts which you normally would not think, right? This is, uh, that, first of all, that this ever happened. And then second of all, that, they, uh, that this was also then punished uh, because Practically, it's not a big deal. So, um, but he got several weeks in jail for this. And uh, because he was in jail, he had a criminal record. And in 1938, all Jews with prior criminal records went to concentration camps. And many of them, and we always thought these were people who had kind of like uh, uh, DYUs or this kind of stuff. But my research actually shows that a lot of the people in the early 1930s who were uh, um, uh, sent to jail for public protest uh, then were uh, sent into concent in the concentration camps. And many of them died, actually. So these small acts could have really, uh, uh, really hard repercussions. So they've, uh, what they had was at the police, you have a criminal, like, uh, a criminal record when you went to jail. Or, uh, and so it, uh, for this one action against uh, um, so-called asocials, um, this was a roundup of all people with criminal records 
uh, they were brought to concentration camp, but there was a special uh, action against Jews. So they rounded up every Jew who had a minor kind of offense okay. in their records. Yeah, and uh, this was documented in the police. So they just went through the uh, police records and uh, picked up all the people with, the, with these uh, um, minor offenses. Or bigger ones. I mean, they would also pick up b bigger ones. But like this several weeks in jail would can, uh, could, uh, could actually uh, you pay with the concentration camp. So this is just one uh, type. Another type is uh, where Jews uh, protested in writing, yeah? So, uh, and there are some uh, things, we have letters uh, where, uh, the, which were intercepted and for critique uh, against the regime, uh, people went to jail for these intercepted letters. There was one way where you got a kind of a out of jail card. These were so-called petitions. In the German system, you could petition the government uh, for certain purposes, even Jews could do this in the 1930s. And what interesting is, uh, many historians, including myself, we always discarded these petitions because we said the Nazis didn't care. They would never kind of react to these petitions. These were written in vain. But when I uh, started to look at them more intensively, I thought, uh, I found that they were actually not only let's say, asking for being excluded from certain, certain persecutory, persecutory measures, but also that they claimed their citizenship or reclaimed yeah, after the Nuremberg laws, that they said, we are real Germans, um, that they said that they uh, kind of emphasized their contributions to the fatherland, like service in the war, um, that they emphasized contributions as taxpayers when they were entrepreneurs. So these petitions uh, often were uh, uh, connecting kind of reclaiming their identity with harsh critique. And the interesting thing is, since petitions were kind of legal, uh, even though the names were known of these people because they signed them, they could not get to jail. But if you would write the same in a letter, which was intercepted, you would go to jail. So these petitions were a vehicle not only for individual Jews, but also for Jewish organizations. So especially in the 1930s, all Jewish organizations, from political organizations like the Zionists or the Orthodox, to uh, co Jewish communities, they all kind of wrote long petitions, uh, uh, especially protesting against the um, uh, kind of Nazi laws, the local restrictions. So for example, in Berlin, the Jewish community wrote a kind of 20-page uh, petition listing all the early anti-Jewish uh, legislation uh, done by the municipality and uh, uh, requested the abolishment of all, the, all of these measures. Um, and then another point is, um, no, just uh, uh, kind of as a side note, uh, what we also, also have to take into account is that Jewish organizations were not, I mean, although they were kind of overpowered, they still had some areas where they could maneuver. And what I found is, for example, that uh, Jewish communities often were quite um, uh, witty in um, manipula manipulating different Nazi agencies. So for example, when I uh, did my research on Jewish forced labor, Jewish communities would kind of converse with the Gestapo when the labor offices recruited Jews for forced labor uh, to kind of prevent this. Vice versa, when the Gestapo wanted to deport Jews, the uh, Jewish communities would kind of negotiate with the labor offices to keep their forced laborers so that they are not deported. So there are interesting uh, things going on, not always successful, but sometimes they were. And then written, uh, another written uh, uh, protest are anonymous leaflets. And that's really hard to come by. I don't have many examples of those. But uh, we find those, and this is, for example, one from 1935. There were demonstrations in Berlin against Jews uh, for going on for weeks. Um, and this was a small kind of like this size leaflet, which was distributed in mailboxes of enterprises in Berlin, in the Berlin city center. And it said, um, uh, uh, Germany is a cultural disgrace today. I'm a German Jew. I'm loyal to the emperor, so the previous emperor, the German emperor. Um, 
uh, but the Germans should get rid of the foreigner Hitler. So, and then the last thing is uh, uh, down with Hitler. Yeah, that's kind of here. So that's an anonymous leaflet. Uh, and we have some other examples that uh, Jews wrote these kind of, uh, kind of anonymous either, either postcards or leaflets. Um, the same critique, which you can find here written in a written form, uh, I found in dozens and dozens of cases in a, a kind of verbal, uh, in, uh, oral form. That means Jewish woman uh, standing in a public square in Berlin in the capital of the Third Reich and uh, kind of uh, complaining about Hitler, uh, cursing Hitler and also the, the government and the German people for the discrimination against the Jews. Um, and usually they were tried in uh, so-called special courts under this law, the law against treacherous attacks on the state and, uh, and Nazi party. And the interesting thing here is we knew these special courts, which were established in 1933, against political enemies. But we always thought they were against communists and social democrats. And I found that in every special court in every town in Germany, you find dozens of dozens of trials against Jews who protested or acted in other ways against uh, the, Nazi, uh, the Nazis. So uh, this is, I think, uh, one of the most important laws which reflects daily acts of protest and uh, resistance uh, of Jewish men and women. And these ver verbal uh, kind of, uh, uh, the verbal critique and the verbal protest, interestingly, has kind of sp uh, spikes yeah, in certain years. So there is not line of a flat line. It's also not strong in the beginning, then it declines. It is actually depending on certain circumstances. So for example, like before, when there were demonstrations against Jews or attacks on Jews, usually the protest kind of spikes. And this is especially true for what uh, we are kind of uh, the day of today, the Kristallnacht. So during and after Kristallnacht, uh, public protest among Jews kind of spiked. Yeah? So, um, for example, in, after the Kristallnacht, you find documentation about Jewish women uh, uh, complaining about the attacks on the, uh, against the synagogues, um, uh, against the, the destruction of shops, and so on. And uh, they uh, usually were tried and also went to jail for, for uh, the public critique. Another way to kind of resist was um, during the November program, normally we talk about um, the, the destruction of shops and synagogues. But sometimes you find also mentioned that homes were destroyed. Nobody really looked into this. This is my current project, actually my next project, is into the destruction of Jewish homes. And what I found out is that uh, we have to also reassess what we knew. I think the biggest impact of Kristallnacht is the destruction of Jewish homes. Uh, my kind of estimate, very kind of cautious estimate, is over 10,000 homes were destroyed. Not just attacked, but fully destroyed. And I show you some pictures which I found for my next book. This is this, in Nuremberg. So that's one uh, Jewish uh, homeowner. This is how uh, the Nazis left his home uh, during Kristallnacht. So they broke the door down, and then they destroyed all the furniture, and then they destroyed the glass, the food. And I only came to this because in the Shaw Foundation testimonies, uh, almost every German Jew talks about the destruction of their homes. And we never fully realized the impact of this. So. But why, why I'm showing this here as, an, uh, as resistance, right? Because these photos were taken by the Jews to document the destruction for different purposes. To kind of ask for recommendation, to smuggle this out, to uh, raise awareness. So for different purposes, but in general uh, as an act of kind of resistance. 
And the last um, way of resisting was also physical resistance, individual physical resistance. And somehow we had the idea that uh, physical resistance happened in Eastern Europe. But I never really heard anything about Germany that Jews would in any way kind of uh, attack Nazis or anything. So interestingly, the, the testimonies of the Shaw Foundation also kind of opened my eyes there because survivors talk about that uh, they themselves or relatives uh, kind of got into brawls with stormtroopers. Sometimes they defended kind of uh, Jewish friends or relatives from kind of attacks, physical attacks. Uh, there's a lot of talk about attacks by Hitler youth towards school uh, kids, teenagers. And interestingly, I found, I think, th over 30 testimonies where uh, the survivors talk about their, uh, their time in school, um, where they were constantly harassed and attacked by Hitler youth, and um, how they then at some point snapped and kind of uh, Reattacked or defended themselves from physical attacks. And interestingly, from the, I think, 33 testimonies I have, there were, guess how many were actually from women? Just give me a number. So from 33, how many were from women? 20. Zero. You, physical self defense. That's kind of like yeah. this. Yeah. 20? Uh -huh. No, from 33, we can't have 100. <laughs> so you are all kind of very okay. Uh, I <laughs> so it was. <laughs> uh, I hear you. I mean, it, it were eleven, but it was for me uh, surprising because a physical altercation uh, at the time was not something women would normally do or girls. So I thought eleven was for me uh, way enough. Yeah, uh, and one my favorite story is. One of the survivors, uh, she said that uh, uh, she was attacked by, uh, attacked by a, a kind of a bunch of boys, and uh, they kind of came after her. And then she said, uh, "I just turned around, and uh, the the biggest guy who came after me, I just knocked his teeth out." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there is this. Uh, you have these uh, people uh, from young to elder. So this is Frank Teilig. He, for example, in his apartment building in Berlin, um, there were two stormtroopers harassing the landlords, which were a landlady, a Jewish lady who owned this house. And one day he came um, from uh, home from work, and the two stormtroopers started also harassing him. And he had some work uh, tools from work still in, in his uh, pocket, and he kind of knocked both out of them, uh, both kind of out, and. Um, but uh, this was denounced or denunciated, and uh, a policeman actually helped him to escape, and he ended up in Shanghai. Uh, so a few weeks later, he kind of uh, got out of uh, Berlin. And since we talk about uh, women, I want to share my uh, favorite story, and this is from Daisy Gronowski. So she was 16, year old, 16 years old um, from Berlin. She uh, was in a Zionist youth group, Hashomer uh, Hatzair in Berlin. And um, during Kristallnacht, she was uh, in a retraining camp where uh, Jewish youth was prepared for the immigration to Palestine or other countries by kind of agricultural training. So let me see if I can make this work. So picture this. She is in this retraining camp. It is Kristallnacht. Uh, the camp is raided by stormtroopers. We're now in Ophir, you see, and now they are smashing everything in them. And then they make us, then they form two rows with the clubs, and they make us walk through the rows, and then they hit us with the clubs from both sides. It's full walk by. Our family? No, that was not the family, but the kids that was with on our uh -huh, It was not the family. You my you mean I, now in Ophir, you okay. see. But you, you didn't clarify that. that oh, well, that's in Ophir. My family was over here. My family was out of it already. Okay. I was not with my family. Okay. But anyway, um, the kids, and you know, the youngsters, mm -hmm. and the boys, they were bleeding. And then all of a sudden, I came my turn and said, hell, I'm not going to run. I'm going to walk. Here I am. 
I mean, five foot nothing, and I'm five one. Five foot nothing, and I'm a skinny little girl. And all of a sudden, they wasn't any fun anymore. And I remember one hit with one on the back. That was it. I just walked so very slowly looking at all of them. Now here are big tough guys. You want to hit a little girl. What can I do about it? Yeah. It's the attitude. And I only got hit by one at the back of the bird. And I got to the end of the line, one of them grabs me, grabs this hand, my right hand, and starts sawing into it with that rusty knife. Pocket knife type thing. Well, I learned a little trick, and that's digging my head into someone's stomach, which doesn't feel great. And I turned around to see what I could do with him, and I started fighting, and I started kicking with my legs, his legs. He wasn't very big either, and he was young. Anyway, I finally managed to get my head out and under the knife, I twisted the knife out of his hand, I used the knife, I stabbed him, and I dug my head into his thigh. I know how I did it. It was just a fast thing that they had told me. And the others didn't notice it. So a couple of the guys, the others were too busy, beaten up on the him. So a couple of the guys saw it and they dragged him underneath uh, a bed or some kind of a sofa type thing that had not been kicked over so that the others wouldn't see him. He was bleeding. He wasn't dead, but he was bleeding. Anyway, that's when we took off. <laughs> so she escaped, was caught again, escaped again, uh, was caught again, and escaped, then uh, uh, made it to the Jewish uh, community in Cologne, and then from there she made it out to England. Uh, so um, I think this illustrates a little bit unexpected ways how people kind of reacted towards the violence and the persecution. Um, and to end this kind of chapter on individual resistance, uh, it is also that uh, let me no, I have to from the very start. That's always the case. So there's also that there is um, from physical self-defense. There's also a short uh, step to thinking more strategically about how to actually defend yourself. And so in these uh, police logbooks, which I mentioned in the very beginning, I found also another um, uh, entry where uh, the police reported that uh, at some, um, during some raid they did in a factory in Berlin, they found uh, a hidden apartment in this factory. The context was that um, this factory was taken over from a Jewish owner by an Aryan who had not really business experience. Uh, he was assigned forced laborers, Jewish forced laborers, by the labor office. And uh, he found out that one of the Jewish forced laborers was a former entrepreneur, a businessman. So he made a deal with him to hide him when he would run his, family, uh, his factory for him. So he, uh, his wife, uh, they kind of, uh, did incognito as manager and secretary, uh, running, uh, they ran this, uh, the factory, but at the same time they used this liberty to help other Jews to hide and to escape. So in this hidden apartment, which by pure coincidence was found by the Gestapo, uh, and this is the logbook entry here, uh, you see this is marked with a J, um, they found uh, handguns, live ammunition, uh, f forged passports, suitcases, which kind of in a way uh, implies that there was uh, a network uh, forming, helping other Jews. And this might have been kind of the central office, so to speak. Um, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately in the moment, they were not there, so the apartment was empty, but the entry actually says um, uh, they had a warrant out, uh, I, uh, two days later they uh, spotted him on the street and since they assumed that he was armed, when uh, they uh, called his name, 
and he turned around and put his hand in his uh, in the pocket, they shot him because they assumed he had a handgun. So he collapsed and died uh, uh, the next day in the Jewish hospital in Berlin. But this shows you a little bit that there is more to it uh, than just individual acts. And I think this is maybe as a conclusion, um, what I, while I focused on individuals, no individual exists kind of in an empty space, right? There has always relationships. In any act of resistance, if you go out and kind of verbally protest, if you kind of uh, um, are ripping down a poster, it is all a conscious decision where you have to take into account your family, your friends, right? Sometimes in some acts, you would talk to them before and you get either confirmation or people would say, no, uh, don't do these kind of things. So uh, we have to think about individuals also in context of relationships here. And this is kind of, I think, the slide or the, 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 the segue then to uh, more organization of um, uh, organization, uh, organized resistance. Uh, and in, in the gray zone, oh yeah, and. Yeah, it's hard to say. I think I'm a little bit conflicted here. On the one hand, I think some of them might have been just people kind of accumulated and then they snapped. Yeah? But then on the other hand, if you live in a dictatorship and under these specific circumstances of kind of double repression as a kind of a, a racial enemy and somebody who is dissident to the regime, uh, Everything you do, you know, has consequences. So there is no real and unconscious act. Yeah? So I think we have to take into account that people knew the consequences. Yeah? They knew. Uh, and many people went to jail. The numbers are, I mean, I found hundreds and hundreds of cases. Yeah? So it's not a rare exception. Um, and uh, so I think people knew what they got into. And then on trial, sometimes they try to get uh, their way out yeah, by either kind of citing they had kind of a mental uh, illness in their family or they try to find witnesses who would vouch for them. And interestingly, what I also didn't assume, because we have this picture of the steady Nazification of institutions in Nazi Germany, that's also not really true. It's much more complicated. So I found cases where a judge in 1941, during the war, acquitted a Jewish woman who kind of uh, went into a police station and shouted down with Hitler. How, can he, how would he do this? Right? His argument was she acted out of despair. But the same judge, half a year earlier and half a year later, uh, um, had a verdict on two other, I think, one woman and one man, who had also protested, they went to jail. So it was in their own responsibility what they actually did, these judges. They were not kind of all, kind of always acting in one way or the other. Yeah? So it's so much more complicated. The individual decisions depend on situation, circumstances, uh, the time of the war, the, the maybe mood. Yeah? Uh, so it's not, it's really interesting. And just as a side note, when you think about non-Jewish critique uh, regarding the persecution of the Jews, there was plenty, also way more than I expected and that we know of. And interesting is, it is also spiking at certain times. <laughs> Different from Jews, it spikes, for example, in Germany in early 1938, not before Kristina. So why is that? Why is critique more kind of dominant in summer 1938 among non-Jews than before and after? It is because there is a situation where uh, uh, they were in conflict with Czechoslovakia and a possible war was looming. 
And people got afraid that when they persecute the Jews, that the Czechs would persecute the Germans. And that's what kind of triggered critique of the uh, kind of against the uh, persecution of the Jews. So it's really, really complex. Um, maybe, do you want to have questions, comments for this chapter? I, I don't think I understand that last part about the, the Czechs, the, the war there was. Can, can you help me understand? So uh, I don't know if you know, so the history was uh, the Germans uh, annexed Austria. Then the next plan was actually uh, annexing the Sudeten territories, which was part of Czechoslovakia, because there were supposedly a strong German uh, minority there, which was uh, oppressed by the Czechs. That was Hitler's kind of, uh, kind of a story, yeah. And um, so there was, and the Czechs didn't go along with this, and so there was a, uh, a time from May till September of 1938 where there was really a prospect of a war, that the Germans would go for war uh, because of the Sudeten territories. And it was only avoided by the Munich uh, appeasement. That then ends this kind of crisis. But for people in Germany, they really thought there will be a war because they didn't know that this appeasement will come at the time. We know this because we know the history, right? But they didn't know. So they were really kind of anxious that there might be a, a new war. And the, First World War was not that long ago. Yeah? That was kind of 20 years ago. That's not a long time. So they were anxious, and I think this, this kind of anxiety provoked more critique than in other times. Yeah? Any other need for clarification? Or? So a lot of teachers teach about the White Rose, about the Rose of yeah. No, because it's non-Jewish. I talk about Jewish resistance. Because I think, I mean, these are, uh, I mean, the White Rose is a good example of a non-Jewish kind of uh, resistance uh, uh, group. And they have a connection to the Holocaust because in one of the, or two of the leaflets, they actually talk about the massacres uh, against Jews. But they were a non-Jewish group. So this is not my concern. And the Rosenstrasse is more complicated. I wrote a whole book about this. Um, the, sto the, kind of the, uh, the, the assumption is that the women liberated their husbands, but the women were non-Jewish. They were Germ non-Jewish Germans. But the story is more complicated because there was not actually an idea or the, the plan to deport their husbands. It was complicated. They wanted to deport all the so-called full Jews and needed replacements for some kind of uh, staff uh, and, um, and employments in the Jewish community and in Jewish organizations. And that's where they interned uh, husbands in mixed marriages because they needed lawyers, uh, uh, people who can fill in these functions for those they want to actually deport. That's, uh, yeah, but it's more common. That's, it's too way, but nevertheless, the, the women were courageous, but they were non-Jewish, and that's why I'm not uh, talking about this. So I think, and for me, it's really important uh, uh, to talk about Jewish resistance, yeah? Because this is so unknown, especially for Germany. And uh, some things we know a little bit better, this is hiding, so for example, but I think this is also needs to be re-emphasized. If you think about, 10 to 12,000 Jews went into hiding in Germany. Yeah? That's a huge number. Uh, when we talk about the protests in the Rosenstrasse, this was February 1943. Uh, and this was, um, uh, the occasion was the factory raid in Berlin, where they tried to round up the last forced labor, Jewish forced laborers and deport them to Auschwitz. In one day, in Berlin alone, 4,000 Jews went into hiding. 4,000. And there was no organization. There was not a telephone chain. It was, they were warned by some foremen, sometimes some engineers, policemen, even one SS guy uh, warned uh, Jews. The Jewish community tried to, uh, when they got a wind, uh, kind of a hold that this will happen. But I think this was the biggest resistance uh, um, action in one day, 4,000 Jews. Yeah? And then you have all these, uh, kind of these people only survived because uh, other Jews helped them, 
non-Jews help them, and we have to, to think about the rescuers. So there pro was a project in Berlin, up to 23 different non-Jews was ne were necessary to help one Jew to survive. Yeah. In one, some cases, up to 23 different non-Jews were necessary to help one Jew to survive. Wow. Because you couldn't stay the whole time in one apartment. You needed to go from one place to another because in apartment buildings, when people go to work, the neighbors notice that there's a toilet flushing, right? So, I mean, uh, or they hear uh, steps and then they know somebody is there who's not supposed to be there. So. This is, hiding is in, in itself also an act of resistance. It's not just escaping because people needed forged papers. They needed to get uh, ration cards. They uh, often also communicated with others. So this is also not just simple escaping. Yeah. And just briefly, you have hiding now, research more on hiding uh, also in Eastern Europe, um, in uh, the Netherlands also, or in France. Um, and by the way, for Germany, there are two new books. One is uh, about Berlin, which is uh, really for the first time diving into all of the kind of problems, conditions of Jews in hiding in Berlin and how they survived. That's a, a dissertation, um, that's a new book. And uh, one on Munich, but I think the Munich one is only in German. And here, you have also some like uh, examples of how Jews forged kind of in, uh, not just in Germany, but also for example in France, um, uh, other ID papers, and then that's how they pretended to be non-Jewish and uh, hoped to survive. And then you have, for example, in the Netherlands, Jews, especially young, men or women who joined uh, Dutch res uh, resistance networks to help other Jews uh, to hide and to survive. Yeah? And some of them kind of built these bunkers uh, to kind of hide in the countryside or they hid with farms, uh, in farms. And there's a lot of kind of uh, cross-cutting or kind of overlap between Jewish, uh, Jewish networks and non-Jewish networks uh, in the Netherlands, especially with student uh, groups. But I want just to share one uh, other example from um, Germany, because this is much less known. Um, so there was also organized Jewish resistance in Germany. I don't know, did anybody hear about Herbert Baum? No? Okay, so this is, uh, unfortunate that nobody knows about him. So this is uh, a young uh, Jew from Berlin. At the time during the war, uh, as most of the, the Jews, men and women, he was performing forced labor. So he was working in, uh, you might have heard of Siemens, Siemens, the German company. Siemens was the biggest employer for Jewish forced labor in Berlin. They had 5,000 Jewish forced laborers. And they got extra permission to keep them as long as possible uh, during the deportations. In the Siemens plant, um, there was forming a kind of a network among Jewish forced laborers. Uh, partly because they were coming from, which I already mentioned, the um, uh, Zionist leftist youth movements like Harshumer Hasair. And by the way, um, Daisy Gronowski, when she said, uh, uh, I used this trick, this was actually, uh, she was trained by Harshumer Hasair in Berlin, and they ta ta uh, taught her Jiu Jitsu. And that's how she defended herself. So you have uh, this influence of uh, Zionist youth uh, organizations and communist uh, leftist kind of youth movements, kind of merging among these Jewish forced laborers. And uh, this handsome young man is, uh, was the leader of this group, Herbert Baum. Um, he uh, was, as I said, also forced labor. The first, what they did was they uh, uh, did uh, sabotage acts in the Siemens plant. Um, but they were uh, kind of, became known because they went beyond just doing sabotage and forced labor. 
So they uh, planned uh, in their group, um, not only they, they, they distributed leaflets, first of all, and then they did an attack on an um, anti-Soviet propaganda exhibit in the center of Berlin. There was a, a big Nazi exhibit, uh, exhibit uh, called the Soviet Paradise um, in the center of Berlin. And uh, the Baum Group um, developed, uh, what, how can I call it, like bombs, fire bombs, and, with, uh, and planted fire bombs in the exhibition and uh, managed to arson one of the exhibition spaces the, the second bomb didn't go, go off, but uh, so partly there was some destruction, some effect. Um, but this was also uh, uh, the beginning of the end of the group. Within a very short amount of time, uh, within a few weeks, the Gestapo kind of dismantled or discovered the group, dismantled the group, and almost all of them were uh, decapitated. And this is the public announcement of the uh, um, death penalty for this um, part of the group. And you see here, Israel, 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 means these are all Jews. Yeah? So that's a pure Jewish youth group. And you see here the, the, uh, the age, 21, 22, 23, yeah? 20. So the whole group. And the group was much bigger than this. Yeah? The group was, uh, it's not really clear how many people were kind of tightly or loosely connected to the group, but it's between a dozen and a hundred. Yeah? So that was uh, uh, pretty impactful. And you might notice that there are several women among those, right? And here, this is one of them who also lost her life. Yeah? And this, is, uh, I think, also shows that uh, what I found in my research is that there is no gender disparity regarding all of these different facets of day-to-day uh, -day resistance and till organized resistance. And this was recognized in, back in East Germany when I was still there, but I knew this not as a Jewish, a Jewish group, but as a communist the resistance group. So East Germany put, uh, had actually a monument here in the center there where the exhibition was, but they said nothing about Jews. They said this was a communist underground group. Yeah. So they did a post stamp and this. So I think this is important. Uh, to have this in mind, and uh, one effect was also, and one has to really think about this, one effect of this incident where they asked this exhibition, this was kind of, such, this created such an impact in the Nazi government that they actually arrested 250, no, 500 Jews, 250 were brought into uh, a concentration camp, and 250 were shot in reaction to this, this act here. Yeah. It kind of coincided, coincided also with the assassination uh, of Reinhard Heydrich in Prague. So they were especially kind of uh, uh, on alert uh, at the time in May and June 1942. And when you think about these youth movements and Hashomer Hatzair, you find similar things in, uh, for example, Poland, in occupied Poland, which is also not fully kind of investigated yet, what can, the impact actually, uh, the extent of their activities. So uh, many of these, and in Poland, they were much more widespread than in Germany, these uh, Zionist uh, uh, leftist uh, um, youth groups. And uh, you had them in, in many localities. And they often started early on to think about resistance. Uh, and they often came in conflict with the Jewish community, kind of the, uh, the councils, because they thought more about the general population and were afraid that the Nazis would kind of react as they did in Berlin, right? With kind of fierce oppression. So there was a lot of conflict between the young Jews in these uh, in ghettos then later, 
uh, and the mostly elderly kind of council members uh, who often, in not, not in all cases, but in some cases, try to kind of stop them from uh, uh, resisting. But interesting is uh, that, so you have here, like the Jewish council, what they did, yeah? Um, and in some cases, they helped organizing resistance, but in many cases, they tried to prevent this because they feared uh, repercussion. And here you have also the, the connection to what you all have heard of is the, the, um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So this youth group, uh, he, Mordechai Anilevich, he is later the leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But I put this here because, not because of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, because he started much earlier um, uh, when he was in the Warsaw Ghetto, he would travel and this was not allowed, right? So he, uh, he would smuggle himself out of the ghetto and then would travel to other ghettos and try to connect to other Hashomer Hatzair groups and try to organize kind of a widespread resistance network. Uh, so long before the actual Warsaw up ghetto uprising. And he realized that in some of the ghettos, uh, they had better circumstances than in Warsaw. So they were not so eager to actually to resist. Uh, while in comparison, Warsaw was so enclosed and the, 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 the um, starvation was really uh, very early on, rampaging through the whole population. So the circumstances were much more dire in Warsaw. So he tried to organize resistance with other kind of in connecting with other ghettos. And uh, an interesting effect of this was sometimes he was not successful, but later on when the circumstances in Warsaw were, were more dire, actually these other ghettos then started to also support the Warsaw ghetto. So they sent, sent food in uh, and helped with other ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, there were, um, depends on the uh, organization and what their goals were, right? So there were the pure Zionist organizations who kind of believed in that the, uh, the, the end goal is to get to Palestine for Jews. But then you had also uh, those who were more oriented toward like socialism and not uh, in favor of, let's say, Pal Palestine. So there were different groups and organizations. And the, the kind of to smuggling people out to Palestine was a very kind of coordinated effort from a specific uh, Zionist group, not kind of of all these Hashomer Atzair groups. Okay. And the Germans or the Nazis allowed the ones who wanted to leave to Palestine? Did they, they permit that? Did they look the other way? I know this is probably beyond the scope of what you're, you're discussing. Yeah, there is something, I mean, there is also research on this. Uh, so the, the Nazis were in favor of Zionism because we have to uh, kind of rethink how we look at history because our picture is so tainted from what happened during the war that we don't really think about what happened before the war. That's why I'm so emphasizing also Germany because at the time there was not a, con a kind of a concept of a Holocaust or mass killings. It was uh, actually the time where the Germans tried to drive Jews out of Germany. And uh, part of this is to connect with or to cooperate with Zionists. So because they would push for that uh, Jews would leave Germany. While there were other organizations who would uh, say, no, Germany is our uh, homeland. We, why would we go? Yeah? So the Nazis were in favor of the Zionists. So they had even, they sent, uh, you have probably have heard of Eichmann, who was the organizer of the deportations. He went in 1936, I think, to Palestine to observe kind of how everything is going there um, and some other SS people too. And they studied this and then they decided if they would support uh, kind of the immigration to Palestine or not. Yeah, and. Um, 
I mean, uh, there is. Yeah, there was. I mean, in Germany, it was a strong kind of. Uh, you had a strong leftist kind of uh, workers' movement. You had the Social Democrats, the Communists. So there was a lot of support for the leftist beliefs. Uh, in one part is kind of very small part, Adi Hashomer Hatzair, which, which traditionally were also pro-socialist uh, ideals. But they were not so strong in Germany. They were much more strong in Poland or in Eastern Europe. Yeah. <coughs> Because in Germany, a lot of the Jews were, were highly assimilated, so they would not even go to uh, Jewish youth groups. Uh, uh, many were persecuted as Jews, but they were actually Protestants or Catholics. Uh, but you have overlap. So for example, Daisy Gronowski, this Hashomer, her Hashomer Hatzair group had ties to a communist underground group. And she did actually messenger, messenger services for them. Yeah? But the, the communists were not often very welcoming, which is also true probably for the partisans, because they knew that the Jews were especially vulnerable because they were persecuted as Jews. So they were not really welcoming them because it was a double risk to take them in, in their kind of networks. And then I would just briefly talk about uh, the partisans, because normally we talk about partisans, and that's kind of very male dominated, right? So I think what we have to do is really to rethink the role of women in this. Recently, there's a lot of more research also that women were exposed to sexual violence uh, in these partisan groups. But I want to focus on uh, really what did women actually do and how important was it? So. Just think about what is the role of a woman in, let's say, in partisan activity. So some for it. Then they kind of provided the food and stuff. What else did they do? they were very important because normally when you read stories about let's say uh, the, the partisans or kind of disorganized armed resistance it's usually about the fighting and then women helped but this is kind of in a way creating a hierarchy because the actual resistance is the fight and the other stuff is kind of supporting this but it's not really instrumental because the actual shooting that's the that's what the actual resistance is and I think that's kind of, uh, we have to turn this around because it would not have been possible to fight without all the logistics provided by women. So it's yeah? Yeah, not only behind the scenes, but what uh, you were mentioning, they had a better p uh, chance to smuggle uh, ammunition because men were usually on roadblocks and uh, were stopped and were interrogated. Women usually, sometimes they were also stopped, but they had a better chance to get through. Uh, so they were instrumental in providing to kind of the connections to other underground, non-Jewish undergrounds, so that they could uh, kind of uh, acquire weapons. So they were, uh, and without them, they couldn't have uh, fought, right? So the same is true, uh, how are we doing actually on time? Uh, the same is true when we think about uh, also insurrections in uh, concentration camps or uh, the ghettos. There also women played instrumental uh, kind of in, uh, instrumental roles. What you mentioned, smuggling, for example, when we think about the destruction of the crematories in Auschwitz with the, by the Sonderkommando, how could they destroy it? Because three women were smuggling out of the factory uh, gunpowder in small portions every day um, and gave it to the Sonder Commando. Without these three women, they could have never blown this up. Um, and um, so I think when we think about resistance as a whole, there is no, we can't create this, different, this hierarchy, one is more value, valuable than others. 
because one does, does not exist without the other. And I think what I also tried to show is when we think about day-to-day -day resistance uh, by individuals, there is always this kind of overlap also with networks, with other individuals, with other groups. And so there is always a connection. Yeah? No, nothing exists alone. Nothing can exist alone in a way. And I just want to share uh, some images to show which I think uh, normally when you see partisans in the woods, you don't see pictures like this, right? So it's a young uh, woman. Uh, she was actively taking the gun. Um, and I think also uh, new research also shows the extent of partisan activities. Yeah? So she was here in this area, uh, where was uh, up there. But you see the extent of uh, the kind of partisan activity. Uh, and women were always part of this. And many of them came from the Hashem Yatzair uh, and other uh, uh, Jewish youth organizations, also from the conservative uh, youth organizations. And just one nice story. This is the, uh, this is, f f did you know this picture? Yeah, yeah? this is so Faye, Faye Schulman. She was uh, the daughter of a photographer and uh, also was trained in photography and she um, joined the partisans uh, and uh, left kind of a trope of really uh, interesting images um, which she took in the, in the woods and for example, one very rare one to see how they, for example, try to uh, help the wounded yeah, by making a makeshift uh, operation table in the, um, in the woods. So this is just thanks to her uh, that this is uh, practically just survived. And that's her. And she unfortunately passed away last year. So. Yeah, so what, what I think to kind of close the circle is when you think about a uh, small act of resistance, they uh, accumulate to kind of this whole variety of different resistance acts. And what I wanted to show is really that, uh, as you, uh, you have hopefully noticed, uh, women and men both uh, with uh, no difference yeah, participated, young and old. And I think what I see as a, uh, a lesson here is if so many Jews in Germany, but also in the other occupied territories, because I think one can apply this kind of perspective onto France and you will find similar things uh, in Italy, in Poland, um, then when you think about the extent of these uh, resistant acts, then you will, uh, then it's, I think, how can I phrase this? I think it is not possible anymore to say that one cannot do anything yeah, in any given situation. Because if you think that these Jews under these circumstances in so many ways resisted, then uh, it shows that under any circumstances, one is capable uh, to, yeah, to kind of resist uh, against authoritarian uh, kind of governments, against discrimination of minorities, because you can, yeah? Because I think one of the arguments was always about the Jewish passivity was to say, yeah, they couldn't do anything. The Nazis were just too powerful, right? And I think I can turn this around and show that this is actually not true. Okay, I think that's from my side, so you are, feel free to ask questions or comments or share thoughts. Exactly, and, um, and actually, you remind me of the, 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 um, the kind of 
most recent example, how minimal acts actually can per be perceived by the oppressor as dangerous. Because uh, um, there was this one, uh, I think it was a woman uh, in the central red square in, uh, in Moscow, and she had a white paper with nothing on it in front of her, and she was arrested for it. She, there was nothing, no, nothing written. It was just a white paper. And she stood there, but it was clear what it, what it meant. But she was arrested for it. Yeah? And the same is true when, you go, when I go back to the Jews in Nazi Germany. Sometimes even acts of doing nothing could be perceived as resistance. So for example, you all know the, the story of the, or we saw the names, right? So uh, they had to, we assumed they had to adopt the middle names Sarah and Israel. But German law actually said, no, you have to apply for it. And many didn't apply. Same is true for the yellow star. They had to wear the yellow star, but many didn't. So many went for jail. This was, uh, I mean, the, the, the Nazis really punished us. This was not something cavalier. This was, they perceived this as dangerous when they could not, when they would not wear the star. Yeah, so dozens and dozens of Jews just for not wearing the star went for weeks and months uh, in, uh, uh, to prison. Yeah. So um, my dad is a survivor, but he has a paper where his family went to the, I guess, the local courthouse to apply for their name change. As you said, they had to put their time, but when you read the writing, it's not that he's just applying or fills out a form. He has to handwrite a letter and says, we respectfully ask sincerely yours and thank you so much. You know, because it was just as we're both like benevolent in his in the way he wrote it. And it was just shocking. You know? Yeah. Um, how there was no resistance. You know, and trying to uh, I guess round up their way into everything. Yeah. But it's also more complicated because uh, I mean I found examples where people uh, applied for this. But then they didn't use it. So for example, they wrote to somebody a letter, and they were obliged to put their na the, the new name on it, and they didn't. And uh, because they want, didn't want to kind of wear this name or carry this name. So, uh, or you had to actually, which is also uh, interesting when you dive into this, this is kind of a rabbit hole. So, what I found out was that they had to not only to apply to adopt the names, but then they had also to inform their, uh, the civil, civil registry where they were born and where they were married so that they can alter the marriage certificate and the birth certificate with the new names. And some people didn't do this. And they went for, uh, to jail for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it's hard. I'm a one-man enterprise, <laughs> so so I was in like ten local archives, okay. yeah, of ten big cities in Germany. But there are maybe thirty more cities where you can go to the archive. Um, so there is a first. First of all, there's a lot still to discover, yeah, and uh, then some of the resistance didn't leave, leave traces. So I know this because when I uh, watch the testimonies from the Shaw Foundation, people tell stories and they never got caught. Yeah. So for example, one really nice story is uh, uh, there was um, this family in a small town. Uh, they had a shop and uh, they lived above the shop. So this was a kind of a two-story building. The shop was uh, in the ground floor and in the first floor the, the family lived. Uh, they had to give up the shop, and this was Aryanized, so a kind of a non-Jewish uh, new owner took over the shop. And there was an entrance to the shop and to the apartment. And the new owner put a sign in for Jews forbidden, to kind of so that they had to go into the back of the building. But they were the owner of the house, right? So what the mother was doing, she actually 
uh, switched one letter so that in German it read for everybody forbidden. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know this only from this testimony, and they interrogated the family, uh, and uh, they kept this as secret, so it never came out who this was in the end. Yeah? I mean, they, they assumed, but they had no proof. Yeah, so I think now, uh, I think studies on women is much more normalized. It's, uh, we have now a lot of more than just like 10, uh, than 10 years ago. I think uh, there's no, uh, more research now starting on children and the agency of children, which is uh, interesting. Um, um, there are new studies on queer history in the Holocaust um, because while there were studies on kind of the persecution of homosexuals, mostly gay men, um, they never really thought about that also Jews were part of the story, right? And so there's now, uh, in general, queer history, but it's specifically also uh, kind of queer among the Jewish population. Um, then what else is uh, uh, new? Uh, let me think. Um, Oh, uh, sexual violence. So there was this absurd, absurd, I have to say, absurd idea that the Nazis would respect the Nuremberg laws because they forbade the uh, sexual relationships between non-Jews and Jews. And I don't know who created this myth uh, because they also didn't respect the law which forbade uh, to commit murder, right? I mean, it would be crazy that they would kind of obey this one law and the other not. So. Uh, it was always kind of crazy for me, but there's new research now that we are looking much more into this. And this is interestingly an outcome of genocide studies, because in genocide studies, you have a lot of work on ma uh, kind of using mass uh, sexual violence um, uh, as a method of genocide. Um, so you had this in Rwanda, you have this in uh, Guatemala, um, and in many uh, genocides, this is a big part of the, um, the, the violence. And now it kind of, uh, 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 new research started uh, looking also back into Holocaust history. And we have the first research, for example, that in the occupied Soviet territories, definitely German soldiers committed mass rape and they had uh, women, uh, Jewish women as sexual slaves. And so there's way more to discover in this regard. Uh, and it goes also in my, uh, let's say, um, uh, studies, for example, my, my next book about the destruction of Jewish homes also includes uh, a lot of beatings and murder and sexual violence when they invaded the homes. Because that's also where they find women and girls, right? And they are in this kind of violent mood, and so it's not so extraordinary that they would commit these acts of sexual violence. So this is also happening during Kristallnacht. Yeah. And we, we know this, we knew this always, that there were some cases, but again, it was perceived as the outlier. But now I think more and more we will see that this is also more widespread than we, uh, we previously assumed. Hmm. <laughs> that, that's a hard, hard ask because I'm not, I mean, not, you are the middle school teacher. So 
Um, but what one can do is one, uh, I think what will new research looks into uh, how uh, Jewish children were affected personally and also what did they witness, right? And uh, I think uh, just the story I, uh, which I told you about this sign which they changed the letter, this was told by uh, a survivor who was at the time when this happened, eight years old, yeah? So, uh, and he was personally affected because they interrogated him too and they tried to get it out of the boy, yeah? And he didn't uh, kind of, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, he didn't, the, yeah, that's, <laughs> I knew there, there was a term for it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think witnessing and uh, how they are affected could be a way, uh, what I could see, yeah. And interesting is that, for example, a lot of the testimonies in the Shaw Foundation or in the Holocaust Museum, they are all, they were, many of them were younger at the time. Yeah? We sometimes we see them as old people, but at the time they were 16, they were 17. So uh, many of these stories are told by people who were actually school age. Yeah? Yeah, so I think the story is more complicated. So for example, it is always ignored that one third of the victims were shot on gunpoint. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's kind of one-to-one, -one, face to face. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I think this is important because in a way the industrial killing helps the Germans to get away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not, it's not personal because it happened somewhere done by a few people and that's it. But uh, uh, kind of killing 1.5 million people on gunpoint, that's different, yeah? And it has uh, also different repercussions because the stories are told in Germany. So we have some research that actually the, the soldiers came back and they talked to their priest. They talked in the barber shop. So people knew about these killings too, yeah? Um, what I meant also with the industrial killing is we have this idea that this was kind of a, a success of German engineering. And I think that's kind of wrong in a way for two reasons. One is the Germans were not the only one using high technology for mass murder because every genocide there is doing this. The Armenians, uh, the Ottoman Empire used telegraphs, they used trains, they used machine guns. This was available at the time as high technology. Um, the, um, the Germans used what was at their disposal and it was not created for the Jews. The industrial part of the killing, like the gas chambers, they were created for uh, euthanasia victims, right? So uh, this existed, they took what was there. Uh, but newer research actually shows that we thought always about the kind of the brilliance of German engineering and this is kind of then translates into Auschwitz and uh, the other camps, but actually most of the camps were makeshift kind of murder sites. And newer research shows that uh, they didn't really commit large um, uh, resources to it, so they had to work with what was on site. That's why they converted farmhouses into gas chambers, or kind of crematoriums, uh, gas chambers. Yeah? So uh, this idea of the industrial killing is not really uh, working uh, in, this, in this regard too. Yeah? But I think the mo main argument is really to, to emphasize that uh, really 1.5 million were killed like on gunpoint. And then also not to forget, during the time when the uh, kind of mass murder in Auschwitz happened, at the same time you have massacres in Galicia, Ma uh, tens of thousands of Jews were killed on gunpoint 
at the same time that in Auschwitz they used the gas chambers. So it's kind of on, it's a parallel, yeah? They used what they had as capacity. Yeah. You said early on that the local governments was involved in persecution on their own, that it wasn't like a order from on high. Do you think the local governments engaged that persecution because they felt that they that would be acceptable by the Nazi regime, so they felt freedom to pursue that persecution? Yeah, so I think it's also, again, a complicated story. So one thing is, I mean, the Nazis try to get into city governments, right? So there is a, a kind of a, a, there's election in March 1933, so a lot of Nazi officials go into city governments. However, when you look uh, kind of on the ground, it's not always the Nazi officials who actually are the instigators. So some of the most fanatic uh, personnel in Hamburg and in Munich were members of other parties. Um, they were always like xenophobic or they were anti-Romani people. So they had a history of uh, discriminating against minorities, but they need, don't, didn't need it to be Nazi to do this. And then you have Nazis who are actually slowing down the process. So it's really more complicated uh, and it depends, and this is what I take out of this and what I think is so important and maybe also important for, for uh, to teach in schools is it is really depending on the individual. What we talked about the resistance, that's true also for the perpetrators. Uh, they had a lot of leeway, for example, in these city governments. There was no punishment if they didn't enact anti-Jewish measures. Yeah, so for example, I have a number uh, in, there were 53 big cities in Germany and uh, they had these um, uh, pawn shops where you do auctions with, yeah. Um, and half of them introduced until Kristallnacht anti-Jewish measures. Half of them. The other half didn't. So it was really depending on the people in these departments, not just the mayor. We, I, first I thought, oh, the mayor is the, the man. Yeah? So if the mayor says, then everything happens. No, it is actually department heads. So it's one uh, step down. And I think this is really important because then you can say, this is not only true for Nazi Germany, it is true for other city governments in occupied Europe. Yeah, the Dutch mayors, for example, they also were cooperating with the Germans and some were resisting. But you can also say this today in the US, city governments have a large responsibility and large power, right? So it is important what people do in these city governments, how they discriminate or not discriminate against parts of their population. Yeah, and I think coming back to your beginning of the question, I think the, in a way there was an overall framework that with the Nazi government that uh, anti-Jewish persecution is, let's say, government policy. But there was no pressure from the government yeah? and there was no punishment. So it was really up to them if they wanted to use this opportunity if they wanted to enact it, yeah? So there was a lot of individual responsibility and you can see this in private organizations, sports clubs, the same, yeah? They didn't need to expel Jewish uh, athletes, yeah? Or board members, some did, some didn't. So do you have, until there is no national law, there is no obligation to do things. And even after you have a national law, it gets even more complicated. So for example, you have the city governments partly excluding poor Jews, needy Jews from public welfare benefits throughout the 1930s. So they reduced payments or they made them work for it. But not every city. Some cities like Munich, Berlin, Leipzig, they did this, Hamburg, but other cities didn't enact this. But then in, after Kristallnacht, the Nazi government introduced a new decree that from now on, the German uh, state will not pay for poor Jews anymore. So they are relying on Jewish communities. So I thought, okay, then from this moment on, the Jewish communities pay. No, that's not true. It depended on the negotiations between the city government and the Jewish community and the Gestapo, because the Gestapo was taking care of the finances of the Jewish community. And sometimes the Gestapo kind of opposed the city government who wanted to get rid of the payments 
because the Jewish community would collapse financially. So the Gestapo said, no, you can't. You have to pay welfare benefits to the poor Jews. So it's so, so much more complicated. Yeah? And, and again, you see the individual responsibility here. Yeah? And also the, how circumstances and conditions uh, influence uh, policies and policy making. No. And now I hear that that's not true. That really does teach. I'm able, I'll be able to talk to my students about personal responsibility because then local governments could make the decision that we're not going to we're not going to do that. We're going to we're going to continue business yeah. as usual. Our Jewish citizens are important to the economy or whatever yeah. the reason was uh, because it makes it sound in the textbook as though. All the way down, no one had an option. There was no free will. Yeah, no, no. Happened. No, the, you can't be an effective regime when you repress uh, kind of individual uh, kind of leeway. That's not, uh, then you, uh, you can't reign just with terror. The Nazis were, I mean, the, the, the Nazi state was a powerful, effective state because it actually enabled initiatives, lo uh, local initiatives, individual initiatives. They lived off this. So they were, it was, uh, that's why they were very productive. They could never held on so long in the war if not there was a lot of initiative from the bottom. Yeah? This made them actually so dangerous because they had so much support. And uh, I think this is not like common good, so to speak, this understanding. But I think any dictatorship, uh, there is no dictatorship which can uh, prevail without support from the population which goes beyond just the core of their, uh, let's say, party affiliation or something. Um, because otherwise, uh, they have to um, reign in terror, but this would uh, kind of oppress productivity, it would, and it would probably provoke a revolution or insurrection. Yeah. So you need to attract. Yeah, there were this distance now from that historical moment. Yeah. And the farther away we get, the clearer that picture becomes. So that we, you know, I'm hearing. Oh, definitely. I mean, the Germans didn't want to talk about after the war about this because they knew what, uh, uh, what they all did, right? And so, in a way, uh, it was much more known at the end of the war. So, for example, the uh, US, um, uh, uh, they arrested all the mayors in their territory because they knew the mayors were instrumental in uh, kind of uh, committing crimes, persecuting people using forced laborers. Interestingly, within a short amount of time, most of these mayors got away because they got kind of affidavits from friends, high school buddies who would say, oh, they are good people, they didn't do anything. And then they also didn't destroy the city. They gave, handed over the city to the uh, US Army. So they are good people. Most of them got away. Yeah? So I think the, the uh, responsibility is there, and, um, and I think that's actually also where you can see. And one thing is, we have to also say goodbye to the idea that everything is driven by ideology, and that uh, everything is driven by hate, because the regime could not live on just ideology or just hate. It needed also to kind of feed the people in a way. And what I saw is, what we often overlook is they opened up opportunities for people who would not have these opportunities before. And when you get an opportunity, if you are a member of the Nazi party or not, you will be loyal. Yeah? So they especially fed young people. They gave big jobs to young people. So for example, in my field with the municipalities, there was a new central organization, German Council of Municipalities as a representative organ for the, the city governments. Um, previously, there were six different ones. The Nazis kind of put this in one. And they appointed a 29-year-old guy to run this thing. He had suddenly an institution of 200 officials in Berlin, plus branches all over Germany, 29 years old. So he managed this whole thing for the next years. 
And he, I mean, you can imagine if you get such a chance as a young, at this young age, you will be loyal forever. I mean, yeah, you didn't need to be a convinced Nazi to kind of. And this is what they did uh, kind of in Germany and then later in the occupied territories where you have small entrepreneurs getting big factories yeah, and making huge amounts of money in occupied uh, Poland, uh, which they would never have done, uh, let's say, in the time before the Nazis. No? So opportunities, I think, is a big thing which we should not overlook. Yeah, so they usually the first thing when the Nazis uh, uh, kind of got into mayorship or the deputy, uh, they usually evicted, uh, dismissed all the Jewish employees or uh, city council members. And so that's kind of was one of the first things they did. And then they canceled contracts with Jewish businesses and so on. Yeah. Yeah, but also individuals on all levels, yeah, from the entrepreneur uh, with a coffee factory, small kind of, I don't know, a dozen uh, people working for him, then running the ghetto of Warsaw, yeah, practically. Uh, or a small uh, truck driver in Austria who then became uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy who was responsible for the crematories in Auschwitz. I mean, you can imagine. Uh, the money he made in Auschwitz was so much more than what he what he earned earlier in, uh, as a truck driver, yeah. So these kind of careers, yeah, and then also in any position, small mayors in German towns suddenly were uh, the district governor of Lublin. So you have careers which are unimaginable, and we don't talk about them. Yeah, I think this creates this loyal uh, loyalty, the support for the regime. Because it's not just ideas. Yeah. So over, overall, to what extent does all these does this resistance affect their power and the war, the, the outcome of the war? Surely it's got to give them a snag in the spot because the Nazis have to divert their attention. Yeah, I would say we should also say goodbye to that we always connect resistance to success. Yeah, because, for example, the biggest resistance act against Hitler was the assassination attempt, which failed. So I think it is not about success. It is about what the Nazis perceived as resistance. That's what we should also value. And I think, in the end, for the Jewish population, it was important. Um, it was. Uh, it was important that also, and it, again, history is so complicated. On the one hand, we see that, for example, there was some effect of resistance act, even of the small effects. So for example, in Berlin, they introduced uh, limited shopping hours, as they did in various cities during the war for Jews, yeah? so that they only could buy in the late afternoon when the good stuff was gone. And then they often had only a few minutes because they had to come from forced labor to the to a special shop to, call, to buy there. So in Berlin, many Jews would not obey to these rules and would go shopping somewhere else. And uh, at the time, there was not, this was before the Yellow Star, so they would not be recognized. So then uh, the city government had to uh, reissue the decree several times because it was not obeyed. And then uh, kind of uh, raise the punishments for not obeying this. So there was some effect. The other effect was that sometimes it also radicalized what the Nazis did. So there were repercussions. Yeah? So one should also not kind of uh, neglect this. That, that's also true. This is, by the way, really also with the partisans. So activi uh, resistance activity can actually radicalize the, res uh, the response. Yeah? But nevertheless, that's not a uh, kind of an argument for not 
doing this, right? So, and I think in a way to do this is, uh, is so, uh, it's so important for, uh, to, to show, because I think this shows uh, that they had agency, yeah? that they were not just pacific victims. Hmm. I think I shared my favorite ones, yeah. Because I like Daisy yeah. too, but I was just trying to think of like, especially at the teenager age, that they 